Okay. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. We're with you for the next half hour to stumble through the stories and fumble around for the key points like our producer Ryan this morning after the Christmas do. You are with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Stumble through. We do not stumble. We will uh, whisk ourselves Elegantly, through. like a Elegantly, swan. Elegantly, exactly. We will uh, glide, glide through the stories at great pace. Uh, we've only got 30 minutes, so let's we go. get going. Uh, now... Uh, it is hard to overestimate uh, the depth of the trouble the Prime Minister is in right now. I don't think I can remember a Prime Minister uh, being on the rack quite as badly as Rishi is right now. Uh, and that press conference yesterday, think about yeah. it. Since when did Prime Minister say, well, I've got this policy, better have a press conference? You say that, but I can think of very recent times where Prime Ministers have been on the rack pretty badly. Liz Truss, Boris Johnson. This is just an illness in the Conservative Party, isn't it? Yet again, we are learning with this uh, new fangled Rwanda plan, which is now going to trump the Supreme rubbish. Court. It's basically just a nonsense, isn't it? It's and it's costing a ludicrous amount of money, something like 140 million quid on not much apart from some well, lawyers lying in their that. pockets and we've Rwanda, I don't know, repainting the walls. Um, and we've learned that, of course, letters might be being sent to poor old Sir Graham Brady, who's the head of the 1922 committee. I think that man just sits rocking backwards and forwards in the stationary cupboard going, no more letters. No, no, Don't no, you must it. be joking. He loves it. It's the only time anybody knows he exists. Out uh, he comes. He's, can I just say, I'm on television again, said Graham Brady. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, as I say, though, I, I take your point. You're right. Liz Truss, Boris Johnson, they've all had uh, existential problems and indeed lost their job as Prime Minister. Uh, but uh, when a Prime Minister Minister calls a press conference just to announce or to, nice. to uh, back up a policy he's already announced. That means there is great panic in Downing Street. Let's re remind ourselves of, uh, of Rishi with his extraordinary stop the boats lectern at Downing Street yesterday. Eyes on. Today, the government has introduced the toughest anti illegal immigration law ever. I know that it will upset some people, and you will hear a lot of criticism about it. So it's right to explain why I've decided to do this. But it's not a given. Illegal immigration undermines not just our border controls, it undermines the very sense of fairness that is so central to our national character. Couldn't quite see Stop the Boats, but he's still got that on his leg. Now, I can't help <laughs> noticing, Rishi, you haven't stopped no. the boat. So I suggest you get a different slogan for your little lectern. Uh, and uh, th these, th this problem that he's got is because he's a coward. He's a coward. He hasn't well, got the guts to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Instead, he's invented some ridiculous, circuitous legal route around oh, what's it's, nonsense. it's nonsense. Basically, Just leave the ECHR and start flying them there. Show what, some backbone. What we know is those planes might be able to take off, but every single person who's supposed to be put on a plane will be like, oh, I can't go to Rwanda. It turns out I don't like malaria tablets. Yeah. Oh, I can't go to Rwanda. I'm coming out as a gay man now. And because of his... Like because LGBT. of... Yeah, exactly, because he's weak. This but is a, this is a hopeless plan. What Guess who supported say? him, though, yesterday? Guess who supported him? Did someone support him? Yeah, yeah. you'd be surprised. It was the guy he brought back from the dead to turn into the foreign secretary ah. that nobody oh, wants. What Lord do you Spade call him? Face. Spadeface. Lord David Cameron. Let's hear his extraordinary, unexpected words of support for the oh man who God. revived his long-dead career. Take it away, Dave. I support what is being done, and I think the Prime Minister has done a good job at coming up with the right package, a treaty with Rwanda that only a couple of weeks ago everyone was said would be impossible, it wouldn't happen. Uh, it has happened, and it's a very good treaty.
what we thought was impossible wouldn't happen was that thing coming out of his shepherd's hut. <laughs> it did. Um, that but you know, thing. that thing. <laughs> but, but the problem I have with the Conservative Party is they're now just so dysfunctional. It's like the worst coalition government. They should just break up and become the new Conservatives, the one nation, instead of fighting like rats in a sack, instead of running the country. Yeah, as, as later on on Crosstalk will be... Uh, on what? Uh, Crosstalk. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that starts at one o'clock. We'll be uh, looking at this story in depth because basically there, uh, there are a load of MPs, Tory MPs, are on the left of the party who want him to stay in the ECHR and don't want to send migrants to Rwanda in the first place. And then, of course, there are the right-wingers from the new Conservative Party uh, who say this doesn't go nearly far enough. I tend to think the right-wingers are right. This is simply not going to work, but the uh, capacity for the for, for for the Tory party to argue about anything is just oh I know now yeah, uh, you mad. may remember yesterday yeah. that a BBC we, we we laughed about it a BBC presenter did, did uh, that. accidentally did the thing. <laughs> we're not allowed to do this. Yeah, we're not. We're not doing it behind this paper. It, we don't, we'll check yours. Wait, we, we, yeah, we, he's we, not we both, we both have uh, single fingers uh, raised towards the sky. You know what we're talking about. So a BBC presenter accidentally got herself on screen uh, doing this. I don't know if we can see the picture. Uh, the Tory Party, rather amusingly, there we go. This is what they put up tweeted <laughs> Labour when you asked their plans to tackle illegal uh, migration. Mm. I thought that was rather funny. Good for the Tories. Also, it's all good social media material that yeah. goes viral bit and of, people talk about bit it. Bit of humour in, the in these dark days. Uh, guess what? The Tory party is, uh, is at war over this. Yeah. Say, That's beneath us. We shouldn't have done oh, it. Get a baseball. life. I get better, a life. Better get my headed House of Commons paper and write a letter to Sir Graham right now. Dear Sir Graham, yeah. I thought that it was deplorable that we... Yeah. Oh, go on. It's just ridiculous. Go on, it's just that. So, uh, as I was saying to you earlier, Alex, if, if a, 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 a Tory MP posted, it's a very nice day today, 50 would say, what do you mean it's a very nice day? You're wrong. Get out of the party. They just argue about anything and everything. What is uh, wrong with someone, you? I can't remember which one it was. I think it was someone like Ian Duncan Smith. He said the problem with most Conservative MPs is they don't believe they, ex they exist unless they see their name in the paper or they hear themselves on the radio moaning about something. It's quite, I think inter it's quite interesting. Pretty right. interesting. Interesting point by yeah. idea. So let's talk about Boris let's Johnson. Let's talk about Boris. Uh, I mean, I, I, frankly, Alex, I wouldn't really be bothering with yesterday's boring events at the COVID inquiry. Uh, you know, I think the Prime Minister should have been uh, on the stand for a lot longer, but it seemed a long time anyway. Uh, but there was one moment where he talked about his own battle with COVID, mm. his brush with death, uh, which I thought was very powerful. Let's yeah. so remind ourselves of it. I just want to remind you that I... I when, when I went into IT, uh, to in, intensive care, I, I saw uh, around me a, um, a lot of people uh, who, were, who were not actually elderly. Um, and they, and they, in fact, they were middle-aged men, um, and they were, they were quite like me. And some of us were going to make it, and some of us weren't. And what I'm trying to tell you in a nutshell, and the NHS, thank God, did an amazing job and, and, and helped me survive. Um, but I knew from that experience what an appalling disease this is. I mean, it was a remarkable period. I remember that because we were in that sort of stack and avite movement where we all had to like get to the end of our doorsteps and clap for the NHS every week. Um, but at the same didn't, time, Boris didn't Johnson. Have to. Didn't oh, yeah. have to. Do you know, I did it every week. You know why? Why? Oh, because we have, we have a sort of balcony out the back of our house and, uh, and the dog loved it because all the <laughs> people doing the dog go, ha, 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 So we used to go out there and bang pots to amuse the dog. <laughs> and then one time we're doing it and one of the neighbours said, shut that dog up, show a bit of respect, shut up. Don't be so ridiculous. But I do remember when Boris went into the hos uh, into hospital and we were clapping at the door sets and I actually felt really quite emotional. I felt really worried that Boris was going to die in it. Actually, uh, genuinely, I was really quite upset by it. Well, the and I just remember seeing poor Dominic Raab's face the next day when it's like, well, you know, if he's dead, you're basically going to have to take over. Oh. And he was just like, <laughs> oh. Like a fox. His eyes were like bulging yeah, yeah. and he did, turned a really funny colour just walking around like, no. But, but, but I think it was, it was the moment that completely changed mm. Boris's approach to the COVID crisis, that he came so close to death, that he went from being, shall we say, 
at least constitutionally quite hawkish, mm. uh, quite interested in people's liberty, to, uh, after, after his brush mm. with death, being prepared to do anything to take uh, all of our liberty away uh, just so we couldn't get the virus. Uh, also, well, frankly, I'd have preferred a trade-off. What I would say is he's come under a lot of fire for being hectic and mismanaging things. But actually, let's remember this. That man carried on working when he was basically about to die and was dragged kicking and screaming out of Downing Street to almost be put on a ventilator. Mm. He didn't take a break when he was ill. He got on with it. And let's not forget that about Boris. Yeah, I'll tell you. That I'm, is admirable. I'm not going to forget this either. When he recovered, he was so thrilled, so happy, he threw a load of parties. In hey! Yeah, let's have a party, gate. Uh, now, let's talk about Prince Harry. Uh, I can't work this out, Alex. Uh, in yeah. his uh, statements, his witness statements to the High Court, where he's trying to get royal uh, gun armed police protection yeah. when he comes to this country. We've turned him down for that. He's appealing. Mm. Uh, in his statements to the court, he says that him and Meghan were forced to step back from royal duty and were forced to leave the UK. Uh, how can that be? By who? How who did this? Who, how who, can who, that be? Who said that? I don't remember that. If they'd have stayed in Britain, they could have carried on with royal duties. That was, what, of course, what the Queen and Charles and everybody wanted them to do, what the nation wanted them to do, and they would have had full armed police protection as frontline royals. Uh, there was, uh, it, just, it didn't seem to me compulsory uh, that they stepped back from royal duties. And, and of course it wasn't compulsory that they uh, fled the country and went to Canada and then America. But What's he they, talking about? They've totally weaved their own storyline. I mean, it's her, isn't it? She's come up with this mad idea. It's kind of like creepy, like something in Greek mythology that she's pretending to be his mother. She desperately wants to be the hounded princess whose yeah. life was put at risk, who almost commits suicide, who had the mental health troubles because she's the poor woman who fell in love with the prince. She even imitates Diana with the way she sort of looks like this. With she does, Tanko right. Eyes, like... pictures, absolutely. Uh, by the way, yeah. And it's it. just ill. It's like, what is this? Oedipus, like, stop it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so he says, the UK is my home. The UK is central to the heritage of my children and the place I want them to feel at home as much as where they live at the moment in the United States. That cannot happen if it is not possible to keep them safe when they are on UK soil. We'll stay in America then. Nobody cares. Yeah, Nobody cares. yeah he's good like with the thing. gun crime in here's America. This guy said, he's basically saying, we were forced to leave Britain because of the safety of my family. And where did he take them? To the gun murder capital of the world, America. America is a lot less safe than Britain. Harry, uh, get it through your thick head. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, Sticking with our, the Montecitos, well, uh, Meghan Markle apparently is going to be dropped by her Hollywood talent agency uh, over the Omid Scobie Book Scandal Association. Of course, Meghan did the very brave thing of stepping out in the public eye after that book accused uh, her father-in-law, the king, of being a royal racist, of wearing a diamond bracelet that he bought for her. How brave. Yeah. Well done, Megan. How brave. Stunning and brave. Uh, she uh, was... Wasn't enough, though. She, she's on the books. I think she's still on the books right now, to be fair, but uh, apparently her uh, tenure is uh, loose. Uh, but she's with the, with the William Morris in, Endeavour uh, Agency, and they're, they're a huge Hollywood agency, probably the biggest. Uh, they are worried... Uh, about uh, their reputation because of the Duchess of Sussex's connection mm. to Omid Scobie. So Scobie has become so toxic that, according to this agency, uh, the Duchess of Sussex is becoming toxic as well, and they might not want her on their books anymore. So uh, what goes around comes around. What's ironic about this, of course, is Meghan Markle gave up a job being paid to act to now act and not be paid for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, when, if you've seen Suits, I mean, act, it's kind of, well, a, you know. it's kind of a sort of a loose uh, uh, definition. I'm talking about proper classy royals and people who are doing it the right way. Our future king... Prince William surprised a woman on a charity walk. It's just heartwarming photos and pictures. This and is how to be a royal. Let's Take a, it away, yeah, William. Go on. <laughs> That's a great moment. It's now, lovely. Th th this was a charity march, and I think this uh, poor lady. Uh, uh, lost a son, uh, was uh, grieving, but this was a, a march about uh, uh, looking after people who were grieving. And uh, William supports that mm. and snu snuck up behind him and went, 
boom. Imagine that if you turn around. Oh my God. Okay, it's a king. But what I love so much is he's so tactile and so huggy, and it doesn't feel fake. Like every time Meghan Markle tries to snatch a child to have a photo taken with it, um, it, it isn't faked. It's just lovely and genuine and warm. And of course, the Queen is like, the, the late Queen. Don't touch the Queen. Whereas this new generation are very hands-on, very natural, very warm, very personable, and it's just wonderful. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I think whenever I see stuff like this, I think the future of the monarchy in this country I think is you're right. Very hands. good point. Very good point. Let's uh, return to the ITV scandal. Uh, now, yesterday we covered this story, the Philip Schofield report, where uh, the uh, uh, barrister, Jane Mulcahy, KC, hired by uh, ITV, on ITV's payroll, to investigate the Schofield saga, his inappropriate mm. relationship with a much younger male member of staff. Uh, well, funnily enough, they found that ITV had done nothing wrong. Oh. Uh, so we said it was a whitewash. Yeah, we had like, guests on, yesterday saying it's a whitewash. But uh, more importantly, the staff at ITV today are saying, what the hell's going on here? This is outrageous. They're calling it a whitewash. And they're also pointing out that because Jane Mulcahy couldn't find anyone to actually say we knew all about the affair, they're saying the reason for that was they were all terrified to say so. What I find extraordinary about this is if you just work even loosely connected to television, everyone in the industry basically knew about Philip Schofield and his younger lover. Oh, who I knew had about to be. It. Yeah, exactly. I knew about it. I didn't know, I didn't it know the like details. Nobody at ITV knew about it. I didn't it. know Come the on. details. I didn't know who it was, but everybody knew we about knew Phil about and it. his that young boy. Like, yeah, know. yeah, yeah. That was just, just so the idea. Staple. The idea that nobody at ITV knew is just not true. But you made a very important point yesterday, which is this woman's been paid by ITV to investigate ITV. She's hardly going to turn around and go, oh, sorry, can you yeah. send my check in the post and you were rubbish? Yeah, people tend to, to look after their paymasters. They and do. I think that's what happened there. Uh, illegal migration to Germany drops dramatically Lucky since Germany. introduction of border controls. And uh, the interesting yeah. thing, uh, you pointed this story out, Alex, is, mm. that, is that the borders that were so open all across the EU are slamming shut are. very fast and very firmly. Yeah. The good old Schengen Acquis, which we never joined, of course, in the UK, but that's where you don't have to show a passport. And it means that, you know, holidaymakers can just drive from one European country to the other, followed, of course, by a cavalcade of drug dealers and weapons and people traffickers and illegal migrants. Because not having borders is a nonsense idea. Well, it turns out 11 countries in Schengen have now turned around and said, we want border controls back. And Germany, under Angela Merkel, who said, come one, come all, refugees, welcome. They all stood outside the train stations in Berlin with their sort of placards saying, come on, from Syria, you're welcome here, matey boy. Um, and turns and out they're not girls, so much. And matey, and matey girls. girls. Well, mainly matey boys, let's mainly be fair. Matey mainly boys. matey boys. <laughs> um, it turns out that they ain't so welcome anymore. And uh, Germany, even one of the biggest tabloids in Germany, which is kind of left-leaning, sort of has done this huge headline going, oh, you know, something's gone wrong here. And lots of countries in France, Macron's getting quite tasty with the threat of uh, well, here's the point, Marine right? Le Pen. Here's the point. Germany uh, realised they had a real migrant problem. So they mm. tightened up on their border controls. Yeah. And uh, just a few months later, uh, their migration problem is plummeting. Very, very few people are getting in. So at a stroke, Germany has solved its migration crisis. Yep. Why can't we Why do can't this? we do it? We've got Why the sea between this? us. Surely that's like, quite easy to turn the boat Just around. Stop letting them in. Turn the boat <clears throat> around. Do something do soon. Do something. Because your Rwanda scheme is in the toilet and it ain't Nonsense. coming out. Uh, now, Talking about, about in the toilet. In, uh, or not right. in the toilet. I did that on purpose. I Good didn't segue. actually, but it does work very it well. Does. A motorist uh, mm. has been found. Uh, well, it's been fined £88 uh, for stopping in a lay-by in Buckinghamshire on the A41 mm. near King's Langley. Oh, I know that place. Uh, Making uh, a lay-by and stop on a He got caught... Yeah, I always go there for a pee. Uh, no, seriously, he, he got caught short, so he pulled into a lay-by, went behind a tree, and did what so many of us do sometimes. Uh, we've all done it. He got nicked by some local council busybody, some uh, district enforcement officer who took him to court and he got fined 88 quid and he's appealed and he said look I've got a medical condition he had a prostate problem uh, and uh, has been let off but I think that uh, the basis of his appeal should be come on I'm taking a leak this is none of your business. Unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty ridiculous. If you're, you know, going down the road and you suddenly think, I'm going to wet myself, I don't stop somewhere. Yeah. And you discreetly go and have a wild wee, then, all right, fine. But, and I don't, totally you're gonna, on this geezer's side. You're going to, on the other totally hand. Totally on this geezer's side, but. 
Yeah, There's always a but. Living in central London, you know, every now and then you just get people wandering down the road and peeing on your front door because why not? The I pub was an accident. I didn't mean I to. Do, I meant to do it on your neighbour's door. <laughs> sorry, sorry. The pub has a toilet, but I don't fancy using it. Yeah. Those people, frankly, need to be shot in the head. <laughs> Maybe not that. No, uh, but, but you know what? Uh, I'm tempted. Next time someone wanders down my little street shoot to my the cottage and Don't tries... take a pee near Alex's house. Uh -uh. You Don't. have been warned. Uh, Pro-Palestine activist grills Keir Starmer on a train. This was Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, with oh. some uh, aid. Should we just uh, get This the was old... his train journey from hell. Find out why. Have a look at Eyes this. Eyes on. Keir, how many more children in Palestine have to die before you call for a ceasefire? Over 7,000 children have died. Over 7,000 children have been slaughtered by Israel. This is unacceptable. What happened to human rights? What happened to democracy? We call for peace, we call for democracy. We don't see any of that when it comes to the Palestinians. 7,000 children, how many more have to die? 20,000 people, how many more people have to die? This is unacceptable. Where is your human humanity? Sir, Where is your me? humanity? Please don't touch me. Please I'm do not, not touch me. I'm, just I'm not doing sir. anything wrong. No, okay, I'm not doing anything wrong. This is a now, now, it takes a very special situation uh, for me to uh, leap to the support of Keir Starmer, but I hate that Scots guy. I hate And I feel him. sorry for Keir. Right. And I thought, I think, at first I was thinking, well, Please he's don't the leader me. of the Please Labour Party. Me. Why doesn't he stand up? and uh, defend himself and debate with this guy. Right. But uh, I think he did exactly the right thing. You, you can't just go up to people and accost them on a train no. just because you're some sort of pro-Palestine Scottish fanatic. But it's, also, it's always the same people, isn't it? That man is clearly travelling in first class. It's always the comfortable, well-off, luxury ideologies. I'm there, I know everything. I'm going to make my point. I'm going to accost the leader of the Labour Party because I'm so super, morally superior and amazing. Yeah. And I'm going to get people to film it and please don't touch me. And do you know what, mate? Bog off. And even if Zakir Slama did call for a ceasefire, number one, do you think Hamas are going to listen? Probably not. And number two, whose health statistics are you quoting? Oh, yeah, the, those of a terrorist organisation. Yeah. What a fool. Yeah, what a fool. And, uh, you know, I don't think that even Keir Starmer should have to put up with no. that sort of nonsense. And as you're right, the virtue signaling, virtue moral signal. superior, shut where's your humanity? Shut up. Shut up. Just shut, shut up. up. Uh, now, uh, are you happy? Yeah, I'm really happy. I'm so happy today. That's, that's, I'm like, that's really interesting because like, I'm really yeah, unhappy. So, well, no, I'm not. Good. I am quite happy. Uh, contrary to my He's got image. special braces on today. He looks happy. Look at that. I lost a bit of weight. My trousers are falling down. Uh, that's true. True story. Um, now, uh, the happiest and unhappiest towns have been re revealed yep. in a survey. Uh, I think what's interesting is the happiest is a place called Richmond upon Thames. Very nice, there it is, very nice sort of suburb in the West, uh, West it's, it's basically a London satellite, isn't yeah. it? It's From, London without uh, kids with hoodies on knives trying to stab you. Yeah, Mick, Mick so. Jagger, Mick Jagger uh, and uh, Jerry Hall lived there for many years. Uh, uh, very nice very if famous, you can afford it. Very famous for a Turner painting as well, Dan. Uh, but uh, that's the happiest. Yeah. It's 10 miles away. Mm. And again, West London is Hillingdon, yeah. which is the unhappiest town in London. But that's where the kids with the hoodies on bikes who want to stab you are. That's the thing. This is what a lot of this boils down to, isn't Hillington. it? Hillington. If you that's can, where they're all from. If you can, if you can afford to live in Richmond with its <laughs> massive leafy park and its deer, it's Hillington, its where you can see, you can see what they space. Look at that place. Great. Otherwise, if you can't afford to, you have to live there. Yes, yeah, see, turn, which is turn, less turn, Turner would not have gone there and painted he that. He would not. Would he? he would not have so, done that. But, um, but, you know, I'm sure that there are happy people in Hillingdon. But, I, uh, I think it's much maligned, uh, and I'd like to say a warm good morning. Good and hello morning to, to our viewers Hillingdon. in Hillingdon. And indeed Richmond on Thames. Winchester second place. Rich uh, place. Monmouth third. Rich place. Uh, fourth, Wokingham. Woke place. Uh, you, have you been <laughs> to all of these places? Wokingham's got a small one factory. Uh, yeah. That's near to where I'm from, no, which place. You have been oh, But I'm from Gloucester with the kids Skipton. on the bikes and the knives. I don't see why uh, people at number seven, Hemel Hempstead, I know that. I don't see why... No, my favourite, my favourite entrance into all of it is Clacton-on-Sea. Good old Clacky, the most Brexit voting place in Britain. Yes, oh, yeah. Have you been to Clacton? I have been to Clacton. My parents live down the road from Clacton. It's a magical but, land. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Clacton. Uh, now, uh, let's uh, talk about a guy. This is a funny story. Mm. So a guy checks into this rather swish hotel. Mm. 
Uh, and uh, he's dressed like a businessman. He says, I'm conducting business. I need to uh, there it is, rather stay special. here. There it is. He's staying there for three days. Uh, he racked up a £452 bill and basically did a runner on the third day. Didn't pay for it. Now, uh, this was the 16th century Angel Hotel in ha- Halesworth in Suffolk. Actually, I think I know it. Uh, anyway, uh, it's not so much that he racked up this bill and did a runner. During these three mm. days, uh, he had... Uh, three very full meals, and listen to this, and he downed 26 pints of yeah, beer. an average of eight pints. eight pints every single night. <laughs> now, interestingly... Not very businessman-like, is in, it? Interestingly, the boyfriend and I were discussing this this morning, and ah. I said, oh, I said, Kevin and I are going to be covering this in the show. And he's like, really? Is that news? And I'm like, well, it is to us. And um, and he pointed out, the other half was like, yeah, but there are also vod- uh, rum and cokes on this list, so I think he had a female companion. Yeah, it, well, uh, maybe, but uh, he's disappeared now. Uh, the FA, the Football Association, and has apologised to the Jewish community for refusing to I- illuminate the Wembley Arch. This was right after yeah. October the 7th, and they refused to support Israel. Now they're apologising, saying we didn't realise how much upset. Of course, why didn't you do it then? Why didn't you do it? Although I do get a bit annoyed about the virtue signalling light displays of the world. It's sort of like, that's not going to change anything, is yeah, it? But it's and not the point. It's not going to stop because you're lighter. Yeah, they should have made that. They but should, there was a big equality match in, in There was a big match there that night. They should have done it. They should have done it. Uh, and now they realise they make a mistake. But they're the FA. That's what they're there. They are there to make mistakes. It's the only thing they can do. It's the only thing they do well is making mistakes. The FA is absolutely useless and everybody in sport. And, and should, we, should we finish on one of our Nige, favorite? Nigel. He's and still Friday. there. Nigel he's Farage. Still, still in a jungle. Big Nigel, he's still there, isn't he? I watched it, actually. The, the whole thing last night. It's actually getting interesting because they're including him in the show now and you get to see how kindly and nice he is. And he did not burn that rice. That was Sam who burnt the rice, right? Yes. Nigel put the rice on and said it's reducing down. That's Keep your rice. eyes on. And Sam went to sleep. Last night, so, yes. Yeah, Sam, Sam not Tolson Nigel's fault. Burnt the rice. How do you burn rice? Uh, but uh, yes, uh, again, a uh, regular question is to the Daily Mirror. How is your campaign yeah. going uh, in terms of stopping Nigel Farage being in the jungle, calling him the biggest waste of money ever, uh, that everybody hates him, he's the most boring campmate ever? How's that going? Because well, he's still there. Yeah, he's and popular. He's, uh, and he's now sort of number two yeah. most likely to win the thing. I think he could do it. But also, he's got a, a sort of muscly social media machine behind him. And remember, if you wanted to vote Nigel, you could download the app for free and find Free votes You're not here, uh, but it would be fantastic uh, if Nigel Farage yeah. won, if only to see great. the face of uh, the Daily Mirror editor when that happens. Indeed. Great campaign, great oh, campaign. Sorry, Mirror. Uh, he understands what the British people think, you don't. Uh, sadly, though, Alex, we have oh, no. come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Of course, you must join us later for our other show. That's at 1pm. What is it called? Cross Talk. 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 Up next, though, is Jake Berry. We'll see you later. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. (laughs) That is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange 